get started. Um, well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're really, really lucky to have Helen Rutter today. Um, this is an interview brought to you by Stammer. We're the UK's charity representing people who stammer and we're a membership organization with a diverse network across the whole of the UK. And our purpose is to show it's not wrong to stammer, it's just the way we talk. If you're not a member, please consider joining us. It's free and you'll be the first to get notifications for events just like this one. And actually this event is part of a series we're calling Stammer Social. And frankly, the month of March is bursting at the seams with things to get involved with. But I'll tell you a little bit more about that at the end. So let's just cover a few more of the technical things. We've got George from HQ, who is behind the scenes running all the tech bits. Um, if you'd like to comment on what you're hearing, please feel free to use the chat uh, function or ask a question. Um, and you should see at the bottom um, uh, in the participants section, if you click on that, you'll be able to um, click on yes if you want to ask a question at the very end of the session. So I'll cover that again when we get there. So Helen and I are going to have a chat about her book for about 30 minutes and then we'll come to the Q&A. So feel free to type away in the chat whilst we're having a chat um, or you can wait until the end and uh, click yes and ask your question direct to Helen. We can, um, well, we're expecting to wrap up at about 12.45. Anything, any questions on any of that? Everybody looks, everybody looks ready to go. Brilliant. Okay. So let's get started. Um, hello, I'm Bethany Kelly. I'm a trustee for Stammer and I'm thrilled to be speaking to comedian, playwright, actor and now novelist Helen Rutter. Hi Helen. Hi. Hi. It's so nice to actually see people. I do these things sometimes and literally I can't see anybody. It feels like I'm just talking into a vacuum. So to actually see faces is very lovely. <laughs> great, 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 great. Um, so this is your first book, right? Yeah, yeah, it's my first book. And it's a bit of a shock, to be honest, to be saying that I've even got a book out. It wasn't really part of the part of the plan. I wasn't one of those people that, you know, always thought I had a book in me. It wasn't from a from a child wanted to be an author it kind of um snuck up and, and surprised me so it's very very exciting to be able to actually say that I wrote a book and that it's here and it's real yeah 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 and can we just take a moment to acknowledge um the incredible praise it's received I mean Jacqueline Wilson and uh Baroness Floella Benjamin and you know it's and it's now Waterston's book of the month so it's it's awesome it's pretty good, isn't it? <laughs> yes, yeah, it's, it's going really, it's really going good. quite well. I'm quite pleased with how it's going. <laughs> so look, you did say that I could spring things on you. Um, uh, would you mind doing a bit of a reading for us um, just to get us in the mood? So uh, I was hoping, here we are, look, I've got my pre-copy here. Um, I was thinking page one, two, five in the last paragraph. To the end of one two seven, we should have prepped this up, but yeah, no, that's all right. That's one of mine that I um that I like that I pointed out that I could read because I thought it's quite a nice little section, isn't it? It's really nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, shall I give shall I give people a bit of heads up as to where we're at in the story? Um, Great idea. So, basically, the the story is about a little boy called Billy Plimpton, who. He's 11 years old at the start and he's about to start secondary school um, and he's decided to go to a secondary school where nobody else from his primary is going to go because he wants a fresh start. He wants to be a whole new person and, you know, make a clean start of things. Uh, apart from one other person, Skylar, who is also going to this school and Skylar ends up being quite... Um, quite an important character she's quite loyal but she's also quite feisty um so she's quite important to him and Billy 
want, Billy wants to be a comedian. He loves telling jokes. He's funny and he really wants to be a comedian, but he thinks that his stammer is going to completely get in the way of that. And he can't ever imagine, he can't picture himself being on stage and telling his jokes with a stammer. Um, and so he has these various plans to try and get rid of it, to try and disguise it, to not speak, to, you know, hide himself away. Um, and none of that really works with being a comedian. <laughs> so at this stage, he is, um, he's kind of making baby steps towards the, uh, towards his dream, I guess. He's, he's heading towards the theater stage and he's tell started telling his jokes to Skylar because she's kind of a safe, place for him because she knows he stammers so he doesn't feel so scared to speak with Skylar um uh, where do you want me to go from Bethany which bit uh last para one two five yeah it's nice to have one person to talk to while I eat my lunch it's actually quite hard being quiet all the time in lessons especially when I know the answers but don't want to say them out loud so by lunchtime, I'm ready to talk to someone. I've even started trying out some of my jokes on her. In my proper voice too, not just a whisper anymore. She's a good audience, but not as good as Granny Bread. She can always spot my jokes coming, whereas Granny Bread never can. I learned something interesting today, Skylar. <laughs> oh, here we go. What? She says, rolling her eyes. Do you know why birds fly to warmer countries in winter? So they don't freeze? No, because it's easier than walking. She kind of snorts and then packs up her tray. Will you ever run out of jokes? Never, I say loudly and do a massive evil laugh. Mwah, ah, 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 and rub my hands together like a villain. She laughs at this and picks up her tray and heads out of the dinner hall. Today, my lunchtime plan is to go to the theatre and actually stand on the stage so I can feel it. I've been too nervous so far, <laughs> scared of the empty rows staring back at me silently. I get as far as the little steps leading up to the side of the stage, but each time I try to step up, my heart starts thumping and my feet won't move. Every day, I go a tiny bit further than the day before. And I have now somehow finally made it to the last step. With only one more step to go, today's the day. I'm excited. More? I, I think I think that's that's quite a nice cliffhanger. It's yeah. quite <laughs> so look, um tell us what inspired you to write a book about stammering. I mean a children's book about stammering. Yeah, so um my I've always written um, and I've always made things and, and told stories, whether it be on stage or um, in various different ways. But um, my son, Lenny, who is now 13, he was about 10 at the time I had the idea for this book um, and he stammers and um, we'd I think we'd been through various ups and downs and various kind of emotions with it and things, you know, things that had happened um, around his stammer. But I think by the time he was about 10, the, we were, he wasn't feeling as much stress about his stammer and neither was I. And obviously then that played into each other and, and, and it became something that was just a very small part of, him and a very small part of our story. And I think at that point, I had the perspective to be able to see it as a story that I wanted to tell and have enough distance to be able, because this Billy Plimpton isn't Lenny. He, Billy Plimpton has gone a long, long way from Lenny. He started off being very close and then, you know, you push things further and you make things more, you know, dramatically interesting. Um, and so he isn't Lenny, but I think I only had the distance um, at that point when he was that age and we were so comfortable um, with his stammer and 
with everything mm. that had happened that yeah mm. it gave me it gave me the ability to see it as a story that well a I was writing for him I wanted him to be able to read a story about somebody like him because he never had before and then mm. I started to think oh actually maybe other people might enjoy this story too mm. yeah because stammering is just so misunderstood and you know no nobody writes about it and it's it's such a it's such a kind of you know complex question of like why do people stammer and where does stammering come from and MRI scans have shown that there's you know a clear difference between you know the white brain connections between white brain matter um, between people who stammer and people who don't but you know eight percent of children will stammer at some point in childhood and you know our recent surveys are showing that about three percent of adults will continue to stammer so five percent just stop and it's and it's just so strange and I really liked um you know I really liked how you drew out how every single person who stammers seems to have like an origin story you know so there's the research and there's you know the things that we know through science but actually in the case of Billy there's still all these like extra bits you know he's got a he's got a grandfather who stammered so there's a kind of question about hereditary you know he had a near drowning experience there was a you know the pressure of his younger sister starting to speak you know it's 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 deeply personal for everybody I mean, do you do you have an origin story for Lenny's stammer? Yeah, so um, he does have a granddad who stammered um, when he was. I think he he stammered throughout his teens, and he doesn't stammer anymore. Um, but yeah, so there is that element. And um, for us, I think this the stammer was always. It was always there, but it was it was quite. So I remember his um, at preschool, his preschool teacher saying he does repeat a lot of words, but it may just be that that's his age, and lots of kids do that, and it's just a kind of you know a very very common thing for a, a two and a half year old to do because he always wanted to talk a lot like he had a lot of information to get out and he was really bright and he and you know he spoke quite early and it, and it, it, there was just so much information you could almost see his brain heating up because he just and so I think we all just thought well maybe maybe it's just that that it, 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 he can't get it out as quickly as he wants to and she and as it, the time went on, she said, it does seem like maybe it could be a stammer. Um, but, you know, he, see, he doesn't seem to bother him at all, which it didn't. And so it's kind of like, well, there's no there's no problem. There's only a problem if as soon as there's a problem for him. And it just wasn't. Um, but then when he went to school, he had a teacher that he was terrified of. Absolutely petrified of. And. There was that, and then um, one of his, uh, I think it must have been in year, maybe in year one. Yes, it was year one, and his be one of his best friend's dads died. And it felt like at that point, the stammer became something a lot more prominent and something that he began to notice a lot more about himself. And, see, and I think that it was, also because it was at school and kids are at that age and maybe starting to be a bit more, you know, not yeah. cruel, but noticing differences a little bit more, I think, aren't they, at that age? So I think it was all of those things that felt like, okay, it's... And then he, yeah, he started to find it a bit more difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I couldn't believe that you didn't have a... When I read the, um, the descriptions of Billy rationalizing his speech and you know how he's managing his parents emotions around it because you know you capture that internal struggle so perfectly I, you know I, I felt as someone who stammered since early childhood you were telling my story and sharing my f f f f f f f feelings you know um, there were just such lovely moments uh, when Billy's uh, struggling with his speech and he wants to get rid of it. And, you know, he's, you know, waking up hoping for a cure. And I thought I would be cured when I had my first kiss. I thought that was going to be it. It was going to go. It was going to be magic. Just like, you know, waking up from a, you know, princess 
kiss thing, you know, and a, a Billy up a blessings, you know, trying to find herbal teas and, you know, like wanting a magic tablet or, you know, coughing and whispering, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's really hard when you're, when you're held back. I mean, have you, have you and Lenny um, gone for speech th th therapy? Is there, is, yeah. is there a story there for your, you know, hunt for something to help? Definitely, yeah. We we didn't, um, for a long time, I wanted it really to be led by him, even though he was young. I, I never wanted to, I don't know, I really didn't want him to feel like it was a problem. I didn't want him to feel like it was something he needed to fix. And so we, we delayed it um, for a while and then... I tried to, I had a friend who was a speech therapist um, and I, I talked to her about it and she said, you know, the, the sooner that you do get into speech therapy, the better, that's what we say, like the earlier you do it. And I was like, oh no, maybe, you know, you just tell, it feels a little bit like you can't win <laughs> in a way because I was like, okay, I'm trying to protect him and make him not feel like it's too much of a problem. But then I'm like, oh no, I should, maybe I should have gone the moment that the preschool teacher said that and then and then it would have been easier so I think there was along the way for me as a parent there was loads of things where I just thought is this my fault have I made the wrong choices could I be doing something better and I know that I got things wrong you know when I talked to that speech therapist uh, friend of mine I remember her saying I was saying you know, I I really try and let him know that there is no rush and we're not going to interrupt him and and that he can slow down and breathe. And, and I remember her saying, we suggest that you don't say breathe or slow down to somebody because they will be trying to do that. And so actually that's not, and I remember me thinking, oh no, I'm just trying to help and I'm doing the wrong thing. And, you know, and it was, it was really complicated, but when Lenny said, I remember walking home from school and him saying, is there anything I can do about this? I think he'd had some tricky times at school. There was a couple of lads that were horrible. And I think he just had a bit of a moment where I want to try something. He said, I want to try and do something. Um, and I said, that's fine. Let's figure out, let's figure out what we want to do. And we went to speech therapy and it was really interesting. I mean, I don't know. I think this is quite common, but Lenny Stammer comes and goes in a, in really quite a dramatic way. It can vanish completely and then it can come back for seemingly. I can't understand what the reasons are. It's not necessarily that he's tired or stressed or any of those other things that may. It, it can just be feel quite random. But we went for the first speech therapy session and um and his stammer at the at the time was quite strong, and he was at the, at that point he'd found a way. He was tapping every time he spoke, so he'd started doing this quite naturally. I think I don't know where he'd got it from, but he was kind of trying to tap out a rhythm, and that in a way was kind of more dominant than the stammer because it it even though it meant that he wasn't stammering, it changed his mm. speech so much that it was it became really quite a strong you know unique way of speaking because he was quite robotically tapping out and so the speech therapist saw this and you know and it was quite strong and then he walked out of that first therapy session and he didn't stammer for about three weeks at all and I was just like what magic, on earth is magic. It? it was the what magic name? <laughs> it was just completely like what I can't get my head around this I don't know how are we ever going to understand this this thing because it's it feels like a gas that you just can't kind of get mm. hold of but then then it came back again and we carried on speech therapy with her um and then it lessened and he found uh, I think I think he got a bit bored of speech therapy and his stammer wasn't really upsetting or anyone so we left then it came back again like about six months a year later quite strongly we went he said can we go again we went again and saw somebody else um so yeah we had we've done two different speech therapists um I don't I can't imagine him wanting to go back again but you know if he ever does then we can try try again <laughs> yeah it's um it's so hard it's so hard and that that really, that really, 
impossible balance between like practically trying to solve something whilst emotionally trying to encourage that person to feel that they're good enough just as they are and it's it I think from a parental perspective it's so hard it's it's impossible um yeah you you know it's just it is a conflict it is yeah it's it's yeah it is really really tough um I wanted to ask you about some of the other characters in the book as well because uh, they're such a lovely bunch you talked a little bit about Skylar in that um extract that you read um but it's it's really lovely how you introduce these characters just as you know you'd come across any other child in school or at home but then slowly you build out the complexity of their lives so you know slowly you realize that Skylar's a young carer you know she, her, her mum is really unwell and um you know Billy's little group of friends, the regulars, uh, they each have something different about them. And even the villain of the book, uh, William Blakemore, it, it's revealed slowly that he comes from this really turbulent family um, and it feels like he's got a learning difficulty. And it's that kind of moment, um, it's that kind of moment uh, where, that he and Billy finally connect is kind of through that. Why, why was it important for you to write characters like like that um i think i just think that to for kids to understand that even even the kids that they think are the ones that they want to be like or the the aspirational kids in the class just everybody's got something going on and that there is no normal and that there is no kind of that the struggles whether they are whether you can hear them or see them or whether you know they're they're really hidden they're they're all every, they're, everyone's going through something and and I wanted this little band of characters that are all just you know unique and quirky and I wanted to celebrate all of those things because they those little so Skylar, you know, she is clearly going through a really tough time at home and what a challenging thing that is for her. But that's also what makes her, that's what makes her this kind of feisty, mm. tells it like it is. And so it's that thing, isn't it, that your journey and that your story, however tough it is, can be the thing that makes you unique and makes you kind of um, special. And so I guess that's that's why it wasn't a thought through thing, but I guess that's that's what it was mm. yeah it's it's lovely it really you know and I think there's something there's something you know from a from a stammering perspective that when you've when you have struggled with something you are far more likely to be compassionate towards someone who's struggling as well or you're likely to see it you know Billy is such an adorable character you know even when he's doing stuff that is really irritating or he's you know made the wrong choice and you know I, I don't I mean I'm you know don't want to ruin any of the kind of in like cool parts of the book but you know there's 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 something really there's something really beautiful about about him and his relationship with his granny and the kindness there and I think that's something that is really important for everybody to appreciate, you know, not just, you know, it's not just um, people who are dealing with something that may be audible like a stammer, but um, yeah, everybody to understand, as you say, that everyone's got something, something going on. So um, yeah, what I found I really to... interesting, sorry, what, what since yeah. writing, because obviously this is so, it's such a personal thing and I've, we've re not really met many people with stammers at all until this point and so we're in our little bubble just kind of but what I've found amazing is all of those character traits in Billy that are from Lenny you know that sensitivity and that, th that all the stuff he notices about people and that all of that stuff as well as this mu the musicality and all of those things what has been amazing is the response from people going that is just like me or that those things are, and I wonder whether these traits are common, whether there is a common thread. It's hard to know, isn't it? Cause we try and make patterns um, with things, don't we? That's what human beings do. We try and kind of make sense out of things. But I, but I feel strongly that there are, 
there are real clear threads um, amongst stammerers that are fascinating. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. And if you haven't, um, if you haven't come across many people who start Dadama uh, without outing people, we've got loads of people on the call. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, welcome, welcome to the community. <laughs> <Yay>. <laughs> um, so look, uh, we haven't got much time left, but I did want to ask you about um, the the poignant bit at the end of the book and I don't want to ruin it for any everyone so if you think that it's going to be difficult then block your ears but you'll miss out on a really great answer so don't um so he Billy gets this internal shift where he finally accepts that he stammers and he's just going to get on and do what he loves you know and I and I just I loved that and it was um a real tearjerker moment and the school talent show org audience go from being hostile and laughing as Billy's struggling to start his set and then they change in an instant when he relaxes and makes a joke of holding their attention and I've seen that in action um, in like professional uh, events where a stammerer is giving a speech and that moment where that click happens that switch from what the hell is this to oh oh okay you know there's that intense listening um and the engagement with the speaker it's it's magic and arguably that makes someone who stammers much more engaging and listenable if that is is a word um but why why do you think that in 2021 when there's been so much change around accepting disability and difference, that stammering is still seen as a bit odd and isn't really accepted. Yeah, I, I've questioned people's responses, when I've witnessed people's responses, and Lenny Stammer is relatively mild, now it's very mild, but even with a stammer that is, you know, it's not difficult to listen to. It shouldn't be hard for people to just wait. Like it's not, it, but what I found really surprising was, I think was the discomfort that people clearly felt when he was trying to say something, trying to get to the end of a sentence and the, the, fact that people couldn't wait they could they could it was like they couldn't allow themselves to let happen whatever it was because they didn't know what I felt like it was they didn't know what it was they didn't know it was a stammer straight away and that discomfort of them not feeling in control and not knowing what it was made them have to do something it either made them have to mimic or repeat or make light of or tell him to slow down or something they had to do something about it and I just found that really really interesting because it felt like something that wouldn't happen if you told people that this is what happened if I when I say to people yeah adults would mimic him back to him and people just wouldn't believe that. They would say, no, adults wouldn't do that. That's just cruel. Why would anybody do that? And that was the thing. It was like, why would anybody do that? And I think it's because unless you've heard a lot of stammers and the differences, then you don't know that it's a stammer. It takes quite a while for you to go, okay, it's a stammer. I just need to wait. So I think in that period of uncertainty of not knowing what's happening, I think that that's where things can be done that are really unhelpful, cruel, and, and you know, and I think that the, maybe the way that people will learn not to do that and to learn to wait, regardless of whether it's a stammer or whether somebody's, you know, there, there's another reason why somebody is struggling or is, you know, taking longer to do something, whatever it is, just patience. I, but I think that hearing different stammerers and different, and stammering on TV or on the radio. And so that becoming more of a thing that people accept and understand quicker than that window for discomfort and for them to do something unhelpful narrows a little bit, maybe. 
yeah definitely definitely um we're out of time um so look thank you so much this has just been brilliant um if you haven't got your copy now is your time to you know think think about, about it but um i understand helen you're working on a second book can you yeah, give us a sneak I yeah, it's, what it's, gonna not, it's not a, a sequel, unfortunately. Oh, I know, okay. I know. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, I will revisit Billy. But yeah, no, it's a, it's a, they, the publishers bought two standalone books rather okay. than, but they, I have said, I would love to write more Billy. Like I, he's definitely, there's more to come. Um, And they said, yeah, 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 just uh, not yet. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah, so it's it's a different it's a different story, but again, it'll be it's um currently it's about a, a little boy who who is going through some struggles, and he bangs his head, and his wishes start coming true, and he doesn't know why. <laughs> so it's a bit different, but yeah, <laughs> <laughs> fantastic. Thank you. Um, so everybody, it's now over to you. What would you like to ask Helen? All you need to do is um, in the, uh, oh, I've lost it with the thing. Um, I think in participants, and then you've got a, a yes, a yes button. And if you click the yes, then uh, George will magically uh, unmute you and you can ask your question direct to Helen. So who's going to go first? You got any questions in the chat let me have a quick look yeah there's a couple um just reading your lovely messages um oh. which is which is great um so somebody uh, ellen is asking how lenny reacted yeah no it's really important actually that lenny that i um you know conferred with lenny throughout and made sure that he felt happy about what i was writing and you know just happy about the idea of this being out there and um I what I did was when I told him my, that I wanted to write a book um, he was very excited by that idea and then I wrote a chapter every single day I read it out loud to him at bedtimes and he would tell me um, when sections of it really hit hard, like there were there were bits of it and he was just like whoa that feels like you were inside my head mom how did and then there were you know there were other bits where he'd be like 11 year olds don't say that mom. Um, so it, it would be quite helpful in that way. Um, but I think he, I think he felt really heard. I think he felt really mm -hmm. understood. And he started buying me little presents. When I finished the first draft, he started using his pocket money and was buying me little presents. And I could only think that it was because I thought that it was really special. It felt really, really <clears throat> special. And I think that he felt like, wow, it's my story. That's yeah. interesting. And I was like, well, yeah, 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 yeah. And then when it, you know, when it got bought and everything else and, and how, you know, all the response, he's just been ch really chuffed. Mm, definitely. Um, Tim, hey, what's your um, question? Yeah, no, uh, thank you very much. I mean, firstly, uh, really enjoyed the bit that was read out by Helen. Um, and I'm looking forward to purchasing a copy of the book. But my, my question was, um, obviously, like, from what the book sounds like, it sounds a, a great story. And as a uh, family, I'll be able to relate to a lot of it. I just wondered for Helen, did, did you have it? Did, did you have aspirations sort of for the book in terms of is it to just generally to give people an acceptance of a stammer? They're not looking for a, a cure. They're just looking to work with it and still be successful. Uh, and that was the sort of question. Really, sort of what was or what does she hope as an aspiration from the book? Well, I guess initially it was... Um, I mean, you don't think about the, you don't dissect these things as you as you're doing something. But looking back, there was a very clear moment. My son was reading a book. He's a real bookworm, and he was reading a book. And he called me into his bedroom, um, and he was a bit upset. And he said, "Mum, 
I'm at the end of this story and I was loving it. And then I've just read this sentence, which said he stammered like an idiot. And, um, and he said, is that okay? Is that an okay thing for an author to write? And I was like, oh, like just, well, mm. well, does it feel okay? Does that feel like an okay thing? And he said, no, it doesn't. And I said, well, it's not okay then. Let's write an email. <laughs> so <laughs> he, he wrote an email. And I think that that, and, he, and it was really, I don't know, just little things like that, which was so, could have, shaped him and just really knocked his self-confidence um and it was one sentence in a book that otherwise there was no need and it otherwise he would have loved it and yet it really hit him and I I think that things like that he got loads of books through the post by the way from the publisher after the email so he was really chuffed so it was fine it was a happy ending <laughs> but um I think I wanted to write a story for him that did that lifted him up, that raised him up rather than brought him down. And I think what since having it published, you know, I wasn't thinking about, I wasn't thinking too much about what different people would necessarily think. Cause I think I would probably have stopped myself from writing it because I think you can get things wrong. And I'm sure I've got things wrong in that. I'm sure that people will read bits and go, mm, not sure about that, you know. Big, I think if I was really overthinking it, I may well have just deleted it all and, and not had the guts to do it. But I think one of the most important bits for me was uh, Billy doesn't uh, overcome his stammer. He doesn't get rid of his stammer in the end. And he, he overcomes his confidence issues. He overcomes lots of stuff that's going on for him. But I think it was really important um, to show that, yes, he... he wanted to try all of these different things. And for some people, they might work and that might be great. But for him in this story, he learned to be himself as he was. And I guess that's the message that I think even if you do go down lots of different routes and wherever you are in your particular journey with it, I think that hopefully is a sturdy enough message regardless. So I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, that that is quite clear in the book that you that that yeah you don't need to change yourself if you don't want to that's what I wanted um it to be about does that answer your question yeah no it, it does uh, very, very well, well and like, like I, I say I'm looking forward, forward to reading, reading it I'm, I'm sure, sure it'll be fantastic, fantastic. oh I um, hope you enjoy cheers yeah I did notice Helen um with some of the interviews you did that I watched to prep for this, that there wasn't an interviewer that didn't say overcome or get rid or, you know, it was, um, yeah, it is really enlightening um, that even now, you know, people talk about stammering as if it is something that you would want to get shot off as quickly as you, you could or, you know, or even the use of it, like stammering like an idiot, like associating, you know, something that some people and it's contentious in the community but it's a condition or a disability you know you wouldn't be laughing at any or body else but it's perfectly acceptable or to as you've described laughing at a child who's stammering yeah it's um it's hard yeah any other questions for helen anybody waving on the screen because they can't um make the tech work <laughs> which was me before starting this no awesome well look thank you so much everybody for joining us um i want to do a quick plug you know how i meant mentioned that uh this is um a kind of jam-packed month for stammer social um, uh, but actually, the first thing is an, um, on it's this evening that I want to tell you about or remind you to um, set uh, your watches. We don't set to record anymore, do, do we? It's all very, it's all very modern. Um, at 7.30 tonight, BBC One, uh, producer Felicity Baker has done a documentary on what it's like to stammer. Um, so it's called I Can't Say My Name, and it's a brilliant it's a brilliant um, 
discussion really between her as a stammerer and then her boss who's Sophie Rayworth and they've swapped roles and um, Felicity's in front of her the camera now um, and she you know is exploring what stammering is and how it you know how it affects, affects her and she's talking to rugby players and Michael Palin and others uh, so uh, BBC One 7.30 this evening um, and I'll be interviewing them both uh, about what it was like to make that documentary and, and you'll see that soon. Um, then we have the quiz. So back by popular demand, we've got the quiz on Tuesday the 16th of March, 7.30, everybody's invited. Don't worry if you haven't got a team, just sign up on the website and uh, we can pop you into a team on the night. Um, don't worry, you don't have to answer the questions in front of people. It's all done just with your team mates and the quiz master Bex is just fantastic and the questions are really funny. So don't worry that you have to know anything particularly glamorous. Um, and then two other things, uh, we've got um, a singing workshop for all abilities. I've got no idea how this is gonna work with everybody on different um, devices, but it'll all be made clear. Um, so that sounds really, really fun. Um, and then there's also a book club and you'll get more details on that. Um, so I'm gonna just clunkily, I wonder if George has amazingly put it in. Let me do that for George. Um, so you should see um, a little email with all the details um, for the summer social events in the chat. Um, and it would be really, really lovely to see you at some of those in the future. Um, so just a massive thank you to Helen. Thank you so much. And if you haven't bought a copy, um, it's not just for kids. It's and I think everybody on this, this call would really enjoy it. And if you do have children, um, I think Tessa's uh, Tessa's comment is just really beautiful. Where you know, in the chat, she talks about sitting down, reading it with her son, and it being a really lovely way for her son to open up about how he feels about his speech. So, if you've got, um, if you're a stammerer, or you've got a stammerer in your life, and you want to open up a conversation about what it what it is, um, then I really, really recommend it. Um, and as I say, it's Waterstone's Book of the Month. If you would like to convert your copy into a signed copy, all you have to do, oh, here we go, Helen's got, got, the, uh, got, got the glamoury bits. So even in the uh, complications of COVID, we can convert your own copy into a signed copy. And, uh, you know, if you let us know who you'd like it made out to, um, and there are um, some really, really, really cool patches as, as well. All you need to do is um, drop George an email and you should have his email. Um, either it's going to come up on the magic, oh yes, magic chat or the invitation that you got to the event has George's email address if you reply to that. Have I covered everything, George? Is there... <laughs> I think I think that's it, everybody. So look, have a really, really lovely rest of your Wednesday. I hope it's brighter now where you are. It's certainly pretty grey and penge. But um, enjoy the rest of your week. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for your lovely messages. They're re really great. I hope you enjoy the book.